Golda Meir was born on May 3, 1898, in Kiev, Ukraine. Her father, Moshe Mobovich, was a carpenter, and her mother, Blum Neidich, was a homemaker. Golda grew up very poor and witnessed many pogroms against the Jewish people in Ukraine. In 1903, Golda's father left for America and sent for his family in 1906 when Golda was eight, settling them in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Sadly, almost all of Golda's family who remained in Europe died in the Holocaust. All of these tragedies helped shape Golda's Zionist philosophy as she was convinced of the need for the re-establishment of the Jewish homeland. Golda graduated from high school in 1916 and married a sign painter named Morris Myerson the following year. In 1921, Golda and Morris moved to Israel, then still controlled by the British and called Mandatory British Palestine. They joined the swamp and malaria-infested Merchavia kibbutz in the northern part of the land. Eventually, Gold and Morris moved to Jerusalem where they had two children, Menachem and Sarah. Though the couple worked very hard, they remained very poor. In 1928, Golda became the secretary of the Women Workers' Council, Histadrut, the General Federation of Labor in Israel, and was made a member of the Executive Committee in 1934. During World War II, she held several key positions within the World Zionist Organization and in the Jewish Agency, which was the highest Jewish authority in mandatory British Palestine. In 1948, Golda traveled to the United States with the objective of raising $25 million from the American Jewish community in preparation for an inevitable war against the Arab armies. She raised $50 million. After the reestablishment of the State of Israel, Golda was appointed ambassador to the Soviet Union. In 1949, Golda was elected to the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, along with the Labour Party, and was appointed by Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion to be the Minister of Labour, in charge of finding homes and jobs for the nearly 700,000 immigrants to the Jewish state. In 1956, Ben-Gurion appointed her Foreign Minister, the second highest position in the Israeli government. Though her colleagues did not understand, Golda Meir's number one priority as foreign minister was to reach out to Africa. The newly independent African states had also known subjugation and colonial exploitation. And so, Golda wanted to assist in Africa's rebirth. In her autobiography, My Life, Golda quotes the words of Zionist founding father, Theodor Herzl. There is still one other question arising out of the disaster of nations which remains unsolved to this day, and whose profound tragedy only a Jew can comprehend. This is the African question. Just call to mind all those terrible episodes of the slave trade, of human beings who, merely because they were black, were stolen like cattle, taken prisoner, captured, and sold. Their children grew up in strange lands, the objects of contempt and hostility because their complexions were different. I am not ashamed to say, though I may expose myself to ridicule for saying so, that once I have witnessed the redemption of the Jews, my people, I wish also to assist in the redemption of the Africans. Golda's humble beginnings helped shape her career in foreign diplomacy, especially among the formerly colonized African nations. As noted in the Shalvi Hyman Encyclopedia of Jewish Women, the only female foreign minister in the world, Golda Meir was also the only foreign minister who had no use for formalities, who flew tourist class, who shocked hotel staff by hand washing her own underwear and shining her own shoes, and who entertained foreign dignitaries in her kitchen, in an apron, serving them homemade pastry along with a stern lecture on Israel's security. She also was a foreign minister who refused to obey the color line in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, inspiring a full complement of dignitaries to follow suit, and whose proudest accomplishment was the export of Israeli technical and agricultural expertise to the African nations. Golda's first trip to Africa was in 1956, and she was deeply moved by the challenges facing the young post-colonial nations. Her personal commitment to help Africa and other regions move forward resulted in the creation of Israel's Mashav, 
a special division for international cooperation within Israel's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Again, in her autobiography, Golda wrote, Independence had come to us as it was coming to Africa, not served up on a silver platter, but after years of struggle. Like them, we had shaken off foreign rule. Like them, we had to learn for ourselves how to reclaim the land, how to increase the yields of our crops, how to irrigate, how to raise poultry, how to live together, and how to defend ourselves. Let me at once anticipate the cynics. Did we go into Africa because we wanted votes at the United Nations? Yes, of course. But it was far from being the most important motive. The main reason for our African adventure was that we had something we wanted to pass on to nations that were even younger and less experienced than ourselves. In his book, Israel and Africa, author Mordechai Cranin states that, in his 1962 visit to Israel, President David Darko of the Central African Republic remarked, You have not tried to create us in your image. Instead, Israel has contended itself with showing the new African nations its achievements and helping them overcome their weaknesses and assisting them in learning. In so doing, you have conquered black Africa. In his book, Moini Han's Moment, author Gil Troy recalls that Julius Nyerere, president of Tanzania from 1962 to 1964, called Golda Meir the mother of Africa. Dr. Xavier Tshimba is a Christian leader in Zambia who recalled his country's progress during the height of its relationship with Israel, which resulted from the efforts of Golda Meir as follows. Between 1964 and 1974, Zambia was amongst the richest countries in Africa and Asia. Countries like Singapore and Malaysia were far poorer than Zambia during the same period. Our nation's prosperity was driven by the ingenuity of the Jews. Israelis built the first and still the biggest university in Zambia called University of Zambia in 1966. Israelis also built the biggest hospital in Zambia called University Teaching Hospital. Zimbabwean novelist and screenwriter Masimba Musotsa comments on Golda Meir's confrontation of the South African apartheid regime. Golda's tenure as foreign minister also saw Israel vote at the United Nations in 1962 in condemnation of South Africa's apartheid policy, having obtained the support of the Knesset. She said, it would have been contrary to Jewish morality for Israel to have failed to raise its voice against the shameful iniquity of South Africa's apartheid policy, adding that this was a matter that touched the very souls of the United Nations African members. Although Israel did indeed strengthen its ties with apartheid South Africa after the isolation that followed the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Israel was not alone in doing so. As we have noted, Many countries, including Arab countries, maintained relations with apartheid South Africa. And while there have been difficulties in the nearly 75-year relationship between the modern state of Israel and African nations, arguably no other nation has done more to help Africa during its post-colonial era. As we say at Ipsy, Israel and Africa's official friendship began when the Queen of Sheba, who the Ethiopians call Makeda, traveled to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon 3,000 years ago. Today, Africa-Israel cooperation, which is already evidenced by cooperation by 44 out of 55 African countries, is experiencing a tremendous renaissance, spurred on all the more by the 2020 Abraham Accords. After the untimely death of Prime Minister Levi Eshkol in 1969, Golda Meir stepped in to become Israel's first and only female Prime Minister. She resigned from politics in April of 1974. Golda Meir died on December 8, 1978, forever etched into the history books as one of the great leaders of the Jewish state of Israel. To this day, Golda Meir is also remembered as a true friend of Africa. <laughs>